In this Navi Stokes solution example, we're going to look at a modified coet flow geometry. So the idea here is we have two parallel plates, infinitely long. Let's sketch that in there. We're infinitely long on the top as well as the bottom. The top plate moves at velocity capital U off to the right. The bottom plate is fixed. And what so this is a typical coet looking flow at this point, but what we're going to do is we're going to fill uh, the region between the two plates with two different fluids. So we have a liquid A on top and a liquid B on the bottom, and they have different dynamic viscosities. So the viscosity of liquid A, the dynamic viscosity of liquid A, let's just call it equal to mu, and the dynamic viscosity of liquid B will be four times that, so it'll be four mu. So the liquid B just has a, a much higher viscosity than liquid A. And the separation, the, each of these layers is the same thickness. So this will be H over two here, and it'll be H over two on the bottom as well. So the whole channel thickness is, is H. All right, so what we wanna do is determine the velocity of the interface between the two liquids. So I wanna know what the velocity of this interface is and I want to know what the apparent velocity, viscosity is of the mixture. So if, if I didn't realize there were two liquids in there, and I just thought it was one liquid, but the same geometry, so this is fixed, this is capital H, this is moving at velocity U, I want to know what the apparent viscosity is. If I thought it was just a single fluid in here, but the same geometry, so what would that be? So these are the two things I want to find. What's the velocity of the interface? So V interface. And what's the apparent viscosity if you thought there was just a single liquid in there? So this is an obvious Stokes solution example because it's the a Kouet flow geometry. So we should be able to find it by solving the Navier Stokes equation for this system. So let's go ahead and put a coordinate system on there since we'll be dealing with the Navier Stokes equation. So we'll call this Y here. We'll call it x in that direction. And just like with other Navier-Stokes solutions, what we're going to do is we're going to make a number of assumptions. Then we'll look at the continuity equation, and then we'll look at the Navier-Stokes equation in a, an appropriate direction. So let's go ahead and start with assumptions. We're going to assume, just based on the geometry, assumption number one is that it's going to be a planar flow, which means that we don't have to worry about any changes in the z direction. And at best, the z velocity would be a constant. It's fine to say that it's zero. It's just not going to be uh, a function of anything. Second assumption will be that it's a steady flow, that it's not changing with time. DDT of whatever is zero. These are these assumptions I'm making, I, I'm just I'm I'm the one deciding what these assumptions look like for this particular system. I think these are it's reasonable to assume it's planar, that there's nothing happening in and out of the page, and it's reasonable to assume that it's steady because we're not told that anything's varying with time. I'm also going to assume that it's fully developed in the, Z, or in the x direction. So fully developed in the x direction, which means that the velocities aren't changing in the x direction. I'm not going to worry about writing the z component here because I know that it, it, it would just be zero. DDX of a constant is zero. So that fully developed in the x direction assumption is just because these plates are infinitely long and there's no reason to think that the velocity profile here would look any different than the velocity profile over here because it, it all looks exactly the same as you move from side to side. Uh, I'll also say that there's no pressure gradient in the x direction. So we'll just say dpdx is zero. And the reason I'm assuming that is we're not told that there's any pressure gradient. And besides, this is a coet flow geometry. A coet flow geometry is where you have a fixed wall and a moving wall, and you move the fluid through the no-slip boundary condition because of the moving wall. Uh, here, we're just saying that there's no pressure gradient because that's not what's moving the fluid. We're not told anything about it, so let's just assume it's zero. And then lastly, we'll assume that there are no body forces. in the x direction.
So g sub x is zero. We're not told where gra what direction gravity is pointing in, so let's not worry about it in the x direction. You could put it in if you wanted to, but uh, we're not told anything about it, so we'll leave it out. And then some other assumptions that I'll make, I won't write these down, but I'm going to assume that the, the, flu the liquids are incompressible. They're liquids, so that's a pretty reasonable assumption. I'll also assume that these viscosities are constant, that they don't vary with position or anything like that. Um, so that's also pretty reasonable. All right, so we have our assumptions. Let's go to the continuity equation first. We're dealing with Cartesian coordinates, so our continuity equation will look like this. This is a continuity equation for an incompressible fluid, which we've already assumed. We can simplify this quite a bit, so we know the first term is going to be zero because of assumption number three, that it's fully developed in the x direction. So uh, I've said this in other examples, but I'll say it here also that when you set these terms to zero, it's a good idea to indicate why they're zero. So it's due to assumption number three here. Right? So like this one over here, the dz, du, z, dz, that's also zero because of assumption number one, that it's a planar flow. So that's why that one's zero, because of this one. Du, y, dy, we're not told anything about, so we have to leave that is. And you see, so we now know that y, the y velocity does not vary in the y direction. Um, just in general, the y velocity could have been a function of x, y, z, and t, but we know it's not a function of x because it's fully developed in the x direction. We know it's not a function of z because it's a planar flow. We know it's not a function of time because it's steady flow. And now we know it's not a function of y because we just see that right here. So really, it's not a function of anything. So at best, what this means is that the y velocity is a constant. right? And by the way, when I write this equation down, I haven't really specified whether I'm dealing with fluid A or liquid A or liquid B. Um, so this is general at the moment. It could apply to either, either liquid. So for either liquid, the y velocity would be zero. Well, I mean, would be constant. And to find out what that constant is, we can use our boundary condition. So you can see for liquid A, for example, when y is equal to h over 2, which puts us at the top wall, the y velocity is 0 because there's no flow vertically through the wall. Similarly, for liquid B, if we go down to y is equal to minus h over 2, that y velocity is 0 because of the wall. So in both cases, because there's no flow through the walls, we'll end up with ui is equal to zero everywhere. Right, so that we'll call condition number six, just so I can refer back to it. It's not an assumption the way I've worked it out here. I never, I didn't really assume that, I just derived it. It would be perfectly valid to say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna assume that I'm dealing with a laminar flow, make number six a, a laminar, assumption, and then because it's laminar, u, y would be zero. A laminar flow just means that the fluid is moving along in layers. And so if it's moving in layers, that means there's no y component to it. So that would be fine to write as an assumption, but you don't have to do that. And so that's, I just showed it here that you don't have to do it. All right, so now let's move on to the Navier-Stokes equations. And the one that I'm going to be interested in is the one is the Navier-Stokes equation in the x direction. Now why the x direction? Because if you look up here and you're trying to get the velocities in the x direction, I mean you're trying to find the velocity profile here, it's the x velocity component that we're interested in. Right? It's the x velocity component. So that's why I'm dealing with the Navier-Stokes equation in the x direction. So let's write it, that equation out. So there's a lot to write out. And you may have this equation memorized, or you use a formula sheet to find it. Either way is fine. You don't, it's not expected that you'll memorize it. Once you've done a number of these kinds of Navier-Stokes solutions uh, problems, you, you do end up memorizing it for Cartesian coordinates, at least.
Okay, so there's the Navier-Stokes equation in the x-direction. On the left-hand side, this is like a mass times an acceleration. This quantity in parentheses is the Lagrangian derivative of the x component of the velocity, so it's the x acceleration. Density is like a mass per unit volume. So this is like mass times acceleration per unit volume. This is your net pressure force in the x direction per unit volume. This is your net viscous force in the x direction per unit volume. And there's your body force in the x direction per unit volume. So it's, it's really F equals MA. That's all the Navier-Stokes equation is for a Newtonian fluid. We can go ahead and start simplifying things, making use of our assumptions. So I'm going to shrink this down so we can see our assumptions up here. First term, dux dt, that's going to be zero because of assumption number two, that it's a steady flow. The next one's going to be zero because of assumption number uh, three, fully developed flow in the x direction. This next one is zero because the uy is zero. That was condition number six. We just derived that from the continuity equation. Next one is zero because of assumption number one. It's a planar flow. The PDX is zero because I assume that was zero in number four. So that's zero because of number four. DUX squared, DX squared, that's zero because of number three, fully developed in the x direction. DU squared, UX, DY squared, that one we have to leave in there. There's nothing that we can say about that one. So that one stays. D squared, UX, DZ squared, that one's zero because it's planar, so that's number one. And then GX is zero because I assume there were no body forces in the x direction. That's number five. So you can see a lot cancels out here. And by the way, again, this equation, I haven't said whether it's for liquid A or liquid B. It actually holds for both. So both for liquid A and liquid B, I'll end up with the following, just uh, d squared ux, dy squared, there's a mu in front of there, is equal to zero. All right? So that, that holds whether I'm in liquid A or liquid B. Um, I can simplify this a bit further. Before I do that, let me just make a note about uh, the x velocity. In general, that x velocity could be a function of x, y, z, and t. We know it's not a function of time because it's steady. We know it's not a function of z because it's a planar flow. We know it's not a function of x because it's fully developed in the x direction. So really, the x velocity at best is going to be a function of y. And the reason I say that is because our partial derivatives here with respect to y will now just become ordinary derivatives because it's, it's only a function of y. So I can also, um, while I'm at it, I'll divide through by the viscosity because uh, I can, it's generally not zero. And again, this, this is true for either liquid. So that viscosity would be the viscosity for liquid A or liquid B. Okay, so I'm going to just do the things I just said a moment ago. So there's our differential equation. We can integrate that twice and we'll end up with the following. So we, let me, let me just integrate once and you'll get constant C1. You integrate twice you'll get C1y plus C2. So that's the velocity profile we would get um, by solving the Navier-Stokes equation. And again, this is, this is general. This is, holds for either fluid, either liquid A or liquid B. doesn't matter which one. It's the same for both. Okay, now is when we start to differentiate between the fluids, because what we're going to have to do is find the constants C1 and C2 using boundary conditions. And the boundary conditions are different for each fluid, right? Um, for liquid B, we've got a boundary condition down here, whereas for liquid A, we've got a boundary condition up here. And then there'll be some sort of boundary condition between the two. So we'll come back to that in a moment. So let's talk about um, the boundary condition for liquid B. So let's see, boundary conditions for liquid B. This is the one on the bottom. So I know from the no-slip boundary condition that there's going to be no slip on the, on the bottom wall. So ux, when y is equal to minus h over 2, will be 0 because that, that's no slip on bottom wall. So the x velocity is 0 there. And then if I make use of that, just kind of plug it in up here, I'll see that uh, 
we'll have C. Uh, well, actually, you know what? I'm going to hold off. I'll, I'll come back to that in just a moment. So, so I'll, I'll apply these boundary conditions in a moment. Let me write down the other boundary conditions we have. The other boundary condition is actually no slip at the fluid interface, which means that ux when y is equal to zero, and by the way, I'm going to put a subscript b here so we don't get confused in which fluid is a and which fluid is b. So these are the boundary conditions for fluid b. So when y is equal to zero, that's just right at the interface between the two liquids. So you still have a no-slip boundary condition between the two liquids. So that means that the velocity uh, in fluid B right at the interface will be the same as the velocity of fluid A at the interface. So let me just call that uh, V, I, and T for the velocity of the interface. Okay. So that'll, that'll be the same thing as what we have actually for fluid A at that point. When we say the no-slip boundary condition, it holds both for solid boundaries as well as liquid boundaries, that the, the velocity will be the same right at the interface. Okay, so now let me go ahead and substitute into our velocity profile. So if I plug y is equal to zero into here, then you'll see that C2 for fluid B will be the interface. And then when I plug the minus h over 2 then up into here, we'll get that, combine those together, we'll get that C1b comes out to be, it'll be 2b interface all over h. So what I've done is I've just solved this one first to find that C2b is the interface, and then I plugged this one in and then I got the C1b. So the velocity for the velocity profile for fluid B will just end up being V interface times 2y over h plus 1. All I've done is just use these constants, plug them back into here. So let's just double check that I did my math correctly. When y is equal to zero, that's right at the interface. This goes to zero and I get v interface, which makes sense. That's what that boundary condition is. When y is equal to minus h over two, that's at the very bottom. Minus h over two, this will end up being a minus one plus one, so that'll be zero. So that makes sense. That's this boundary condition. All right, so that's the velocity profile for, for liquid B. Now let's do liquid A. For liquid A, we have no slip on the top wall. So that means the velocity in the x direction for liquid A at y is equal to capital H over 2 will equal capital W, or capital U, sorry. So that's sticking to the top wall. And then we also have the same boundary condition we have for liquid B at the interface. No slip at fluid interface. means that the x velocity for liquid A at y is equal to zero is V interface. All right, so we can make use of these. Um, that second boundary condition, so all I'm doing is, is using these boundary conditions back with that general velocity profile. So this just tells us that C2A is V interface. And then when I combine these two together, what we'll get is C1a will be 2 times u minus v interface divided by h. So that when you combine it all together, the, x, the velocity in the x direction for liquid a will be 2 times uh, u minus v interface times y over h plus V interface. So there's just a little bit of algebra involved to get to that. But all I've done is plugged in our, our boundary conditions, I mean our constants that we found from the boundary conditions back into our expression up here, and then just rewrote it. So let's just double check that this makes sense. When y is equal to h over 2, this should be equal to 0. So h over 2, that makes um, 
this will be one half times the two, just makes it one, and I'll get y minus v interface plus v interface, so that gives me the u, so that satisfies that boundary condition. And when y is equal to zero, this whole thing goes to zero, and I get v interface, which satisfies that boundary condition. It's a good idea just to double check that um, your velocity profile does indeed satisfy your boundary conditions, just to make sure you haven't made any real mistakes. Okay, so now we have the velocity profiles for both. Both, by the way, are linear. You can see that we have um, just a, kind of a linear function of y here. So that's kind of interesting, but it still doesn't give us our, our interface velocity. These, these velocity profiles in are in, the uxs here are in terms of v interface, and that's what we're trying to find is what that interface velocity is. So the way we can find that is we can make use of one other boundary condition and that other boundary condition is that the stresses are continuous across the interface. So, so far we've just been talking about uh, continuous velocities, the kind of the no-slip boundary condition across the interface. But the other thing is that stresses are constant across the interface too. So whatever shear stress we have acting in liquid A will be the same shear stress in liquid B. Similarly, whatever kind of normal stress or pressure we have in liquid A will be the same uh, normal stress or pressure acting in liquid B. That, we make use of that all the time. You just haven't realized it. Whenever we talked about a free surface where we have like a liquid here and we have an atmosphere up here, like air, we say this is atmospheric pressure right at the, so it's atmospheric pressure right there, but it's also atmospheric pressure right at the surface of the liquid as well because the stresses are continuous across that boundary. It's whatever pressure is up here, it's the same pressure down there, um, assuming we have no surface tension. Um, so we've been making use of actually the fact that stresses are continuous across the boundary. We just haven't talked about it like that. So the other boundary condition we'll use to find V interfaces, we'll say that the shear stresses are exactly the same across that interface. So what that means is that the shear stress in liquid A at y is equal to zero should be the same as the shear stress in liquid B at y is equal to zero. So this will be mu A times dux dy evaluated at y is equal to zero is equal to mu B times dux. And this, by the way, is um, the velocity for liquid A there, and this is velocity for liquid B there. So dux B dy at y is equal to zero. So over on the left-hand side, we can take the derivative of, of our velocity with respect to y. And we'll get a 2 times u minus v interface all over h. And then over on the right-hand side, when we take that derivative, it'll be 2 times v interface all over h. Okay, and then uh, you can see we can divide through by the 2 and the h. And I'm trying to solve for v interface, so let me do a little rearranging here. Now you're just watching me go through the algebra, just double checking that I'm doing it correctly. So then we'll have v interface 1 plus mu a over mu b is equal to, let me just double check I'm doing this right, should be equal to, oops, sorry about that. Actually, let me, let me flip this around. Sorry you're watching me go through this. So this will be u minus v interface is equal to mu b all over mu a times v interface. So uh, we'll have v interface times 1 plus mu b over mu a is equal to u. And so v interface will be u all over 1 plus mu b all over mu, or divided by mu a like that. So now we have our interface velocity. And we were told that the 
the ratio, so mu b we were told was uh, 4 times mu and mu a was just mu. That was given in the problem statement. Go back up here and just show you. Mu a was just mu, mu b was 4 mu. So we have that, so this will just end up being capital U all over 1 plus 4. So this will just be 1 fifth capital U. So our interface velocity will just be one-fifth the top plate velocity for this case. Okay, so just a quick recap of how we got to this point. Recall that uh, we, we set up our geometry. So this, this was a given, what the system looked like, until we had these two different liquids. We then did a Navier-Stokes solution for both of them simultaneously. So we, we made our assumptions about it being planar, steady, fully developed, etc. We examined the continuity equation to find that it's a, basically a laminar flow. We saw the Navier-Stokes equation in the x-direction. And we got a, an expression that's general for both liquid A and liquid B. And then to differentiate them, uh, it comes through through the boundary conditions. So for liquid B, we have no slip at the bottom wall, no slip at the fluid interface. That's probably the trickiest thing is the no slip at the fluid interface. You might not recognize that right away, but the no slip condition holds both at solid boundaries and fluid boundaries. And then we did the same thing for liquid A, no slip on the top wall, no slip at the fluid interface. So we got our velocity profiles then for each fluid. And if I sketch these out, by the way, it might look something like this. So here's our center line. Um, if I sketched out what the velocity profile looked like, in here, I think it, um, it looks something like this. So this is liquid B, and this is liquid A, and this is the capital U velocity up here, and this one is fixed down here. So they just have different slopes right at the interface. You can see the velocity is continuous here. Okay. So we, we found the velocities, but uh, what we realized was there's a V interface here, so we needed something else to try to, to uh, isolate what V interface is. And what we did is we said that the stresses are continuous across the boundary. So that's another boundary condition, is that, that both the normal and shear stresses are continuous across the boundary. So we made use of the shear stress uh, continuity there. And then we substituted in mu times du dy, and then solved it down and finally got what our interface velocity was in terms of the wall boundary. Okay, so that, that was just a recap. Now, the second part of this problem was asking, um, if, we, if we replace, if we pretend we didn't realize that there were two liquids in there and that there was just a single liquid, so this is the geometry again, if we just pretend that there's just a single liquid in here, and we, we didn't realize there were two liquids, what would the apparent viscosity be? In other words, um, you know, we have to apply some shear stress on this top wall in order to move it off to the side, right? So we have to apply some shear stress to get it to move at velocity capital U. Um, if, if, you know, whatever shear stress we're applying to the real situation with the two liquids, um, that should be the same shear stress that we would have if we just imagine there was just a single liquid in there. So if it was just a single liquid, the, the shear stress at the wall up here, this is at the top wall, if it was just a single liquid, it would be like this apparent viscosity times the velocity gradient. Remember that for a single liquid in a quet flow, this is just a uniform velocity, and the velocity gradient would be capital U over H. Right, because this profile would look like capital U times Y over H. The Y is given at the bottom here. You've done this before. We've, we've derived this in a previous example. So when you take dUx, dy, that's just a capital U over H. So that's how I got this term here. So that's the shear stress we would imagine having to use if this was a single fluid. And if you want... That, that the shear stress um, on this wall up here using the real situation would be the shear stress exerted on the wall by liquid A. So we would have to set that equal to the shear stress on the wall for liquid A. So let me write that as uh, 
shear stress on the wall for liquid A, that's going to be mu A times dux dy evaluated when y is equal to h over 2, just at the top wall. And this is uh, the velocity for uh, liquid A. So that would be mu A times, we go up here, take the derivative of this respect to y, with respect to y, so that's 2 u minus b int all over h. Right, so that's just the velocity gradient right here. It's just my dux a dy. Looks like that. I can, of course, substitute in for the interface velocity because I just derived it right up here. So this would be 2, oh, let me rewrite that, mu a. So that would be 2 times, when I substitute this in, this would be, uh, what, 4 fifths? times capital U, all over H. And then I would set these two shear stresses equal to one another. So these would be equal, because I'm, I'm imagining that I've replaced the real situation, which has two fluids, with the single fluid case. So in that case, I'd have mu apparent times capital U over H equal to mu A times, that's what, 8 fifths capital U over H. H cancels out, the capital U cancels out, so the mu apparent would look like 8 fifths mu A. Or since we said mu A was just mu, it would be 8 fifths mu. So that's what the apparent viscosity would look like. Again, it, it would give us the same shear stress on the upper wall. The, the idea is this, that um, you know, in order to have this situation with two liquids, we have to apply some shear stress on the upper wall here in order to move the top wall at velocity u, but we have the two liquids in here. I want to know if I replaced it with a single fluid and applied, um, and I still wanted to move it at velocity capital U, what wall shear stress, or I'm sorry, uh, and, and applied the same wall shear stress to get to that velocity u, what would be the equivalent viscosity I would have to have in the fluid, and that, that's what this is. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. This is a, 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 a good example of a Navier-Stokes solution where you really have to be careful of the boundary conditions. The, the, the hardest part of this problem is knowing that we have no slip at the fluid interface and that we would have uh, the same stresses across the interface. That, that's by far the hardest part of this problem. All right, so we'll go ahead and end the example there.